Hello beautiful people, it's your fashionista friend here, and today we are spilling the tea on Paris Hilton's new memoir. This is my second installment of I read insert book title here so you don't have to, and I want to give credit to where it's due and say that the YouTuber Uncarly inspired me to do this series, and so I just wanted to give her a little shout out there. And before we get into all the spoilers of this book, I do want to give a few trigger warnings. So I'm going to start with my general review of the book and then I'm going to break it down for you in chronological order of the events that happened in Paris's life. So my general review, I feel like celebrity memoirs kind of have a bad rep, but this book was well written. I want to read an example to you. This is when Paris's mom found her diary and was reading it to her friends. In the realm of bad things that happen to kids, this is not a big deal. I get that. I'm just mentioning it because in the moment it stayed with me for a long time. Like when a glass slips from your hand and breaks in the sink. In the big picture it's not a big deal but in the moment you know the fragile nature of things and it makes you feel weirdly fragile yourself that was such a good analogy right there it's like when you break a glass you're all spooked and scared and afraid of cutting yourself on accident and it feels like a big deal in the moment of when you break a glass but in the grand scheme of things it's very small that's just a really good example of how well written this book is i also appreciate that Paris acknowledges how privileged she is and how grateful she is throughout the novel. Another thing about the book, though, is it was all over the place. It was not in chronological order of the events that happened in her life. She says this is because it had to do with her ADHD, and I want to read a passage to you about this. This is my brain. It has to do a lot with this whole book thing is going to play out because I love run-on sentences and dashes and, and sentence fragments. I'm probably going to jump around a lot while I tell the story. She definitely jumped around a lot while she told the story. And then I want to read this other little passage passage to you before we move on. There are so many young women who need to hear this story. I don't want them to learn from my mistakes. I want them to stop hating themselves for the mistakes they make on their own. I want them to laugh and see they do have a voice and their own brand of intelligence. And girl, fitting in. And as a young woman that read this book, I feel like she really nailed it on that last statement there. So what I want to start off with is her family dynamic because I feel like that's going to make the rest of this video make a lot more sense. So Conrad Hilton is her great-grandfather and he's the guy that found Hilton Hotels. And Paris said, despite what most people think, her family didn't get a lot of inheritance from him. Paris, I love you, but like I feel like every Nepo baby is like trying to like prove themselves that their parents didn't give them a leg up in life. And her mom and and dad were the king and queen of sweeping things under the rug and what that means is if something bad happens they just kind of pretend it didn't happen at all just forget they happened and move on um paris and her sister were very close growing up they were best friends paris said she doesn't remember anything before her sister being born nikki so moving on to paris's childhood she said that she was bullied a lot in her early years of school and she was not a good student the bullying really affected her grades and also she had undiagnosed adhd at the time as well and and she ended up getting kicked out of schools, um, quite a few schools, like one time at a school at Buckley. She was very close with Nicole Richie at this time. Paris had ditched class to apparently go to McDonald's with some boys and snuck out. And then at the end of the school year, she was not allowed to come back for the next year. And I, was, I just found that kind of strange though. It's like, are you, you get expelled for just sneaking out once? Like, is there more to that story? I'm, I'm being, I love Paris, but I'm trying to be unbiased here. Then at some point around that time, Paris heard Nikki say that's hot and it really stuck and resonated with her. Obviously, Obviously, we know that's her number one catchphrase. And I appreciate that she credits her sister to coming up with that phrase. And Paris, during her middle school years, started saying it a lot and it actually caught on. All the kids were saying that's hot at her school. She made fetch happen, basically. Then in her eighth grade year, Paris had an inappropriate relationship with her teacher. She called him Mr. Abercrombie in the book. He looked like a Abercrombie model, apparently, and all the students had a crush on him. And then one day he told Paris that he had a crush on her and he gave her the, his personal phone number and they would talk on the phone every night. He would always ask, are your parents home? And then one night they weren't home and he was like, come outside creepy. Was he always just waiting outside of her house? And so what she did is she snuck out to see him. And so she gets in the car with him and then he leans over and kisses her. And then all of a sudden her parents pull into the driveway and he starts be freaking out and crying. And he's like, oh my God, my life's over. I can't believe this. Why did you make me do this? Putting the blame on her. So messed up. And then he dumped her out of the car and she ran back up and snuck back into her room. And then her parents came in the house fuming. But then after that, they never talked about it again they swept that one under the rug. The following summer, 
Paris's parents sent her to her grandma's house and they, she calls her Graham Cracker, which I think is awesome. So she was supposed to stay just the summer there with Graham Cracker, but she ended up staying longer because of the teacher situation. And she doesn't think that the parents reported it because they were afraid of bad press. And what's really sad is she, she said that for 25 years, she felt like that was her real first kiss to the teacher. Then moving on to Paris's teen years, she was the queen of sneaking out. She was living in New York City at the time. She would hang out with Vogue dancers drag queens, Harajuku girls, and learn the key elements of partying like a rock star. She said she didn't drink or do drugs at this time. She'd always carry around a Sprite and an unlit cigarette. And then fast forward, she's on a family vacation with Nicole Richie, and their families are in Las Vegas together. The girls had their own hotel room, and they sneak out, and we're just exploring on the Las Vegas Strip. And apparently, past 9 p.m., minors cannot be outside. It's a curfew. I didn't know that, but learn something new every day. A cop arrested them for that. And then Paris wasn't allowed to see Nicole Richie for a while. She said, I got good at scoping out the best parties and music and DJs. I spent most of the day sleeping. Paris got really into raving. She'd sneak out and rave all night and then come back home at like four in the morning. And eventually she would rave so late that she would just not come home. She would stay with a friend. And her parents were so worried about her. They thought that she went missing and she was constantly ditching school and dropped out at one point. Also at this time, Paris wanted to be a model and her mom was really afraid of that because her mom was a child star, pretty much exploited uh, allegedly for acting gigs and modeling. It was something she was born into and forced to do. So Kathy Hilton didn't want the same thing for Paris. Kathy did not want Paris modeling, but Paris wanted to model because Paris liked being shot by the paparazzi and doing photo shoots like that. But her mom was so afraid because of her own past in the entertainment industry. Then another story from her teenage years Paris mentioned was the time that she had been roofied. Her and her friend were at the mall and they'd always seen these cute guys hanging around at the mall. They were like acquaintances with them. And then one day the guys invited the two girls to come over to like one of their apartments and they were older. One of the guys was pressuring Paris to drink a wine cooler and he was saying, come on, drink it, drink it. She took a sip of it and then blacked out. She woke up the next morning in that apartment and the guy, he's like, did you have any bad dreams? Do you remember anything? And she freaked out. She didn't remember anything and she was also a virgin at that point and she just bolted out of there. And that really messed up her trust and her relationship with men as well. One night, Paris was having dinner with her family. It's crazy how the world works. Everything just happens for a reason or falls into place at the right time. This one night, Paris decided she wasn't going to sneak out and go out and party and instead had an early night and went to bed. And then at 4.30 in the morning, these huge bodyguard looking guys come in and grab her from her bed. And, and Paris is putting up a fight and is freaking out. And while she's carried out of there, she's yelling for her parents and screaming and crying. And her parents peek out from the door and they're crying but they see it happening and then she gets brought to an airport and that's when they tell her that she's going to this troubled teen school this is the first one she goes to and this school is called CEDU and she gets there she's in a bunk room and she has a big sister kind of like a mentor there and the girl's like yeah the two years here they'll fly by you can't leave until you're 18 and actually a lot of the kids here they stick around and become counselors once they're done with the program and I'm just gonna read off to you the rules of this school. It's intense. No swearing, singing, humming, or throat clearing, no dancing, skipping, or spinning, no touching, hugging, kissing, or holding hands, no crossing your legs, no shuffling your feet, no whistling, no breathing too loud, no smacking your lips while eating, no talking about music, sports, television, movies, news events, your parents, your siblings, your friends, your clothes, your room, your school, or anything else about home. No mention of Marilyn Manson. No looking out for a window without permission. No asking to go to the bathroom without permission. No opening a door without permission or looking out a window. No asking for food or water no eating outside mealtime, and no leaving. Just, it was impossible to basically not break a rule, and it was very strict. And then they had this program there, this group therapy called RAP, R-A-P, and I cannot believe they did this to the children. Basically what it was is they'd have all the students come in a room together, and then they'd pick one child that had been misbehaving, and they'd say, okay, this is the target. All the students and staff would just mouth off onto this one child and say the nastiest, most degrading things ever. They would look at the person's files and make it personal too. And they wouldn't stop degrading the child until the child broke down crying. And I'm thinking, how is this therapeutic? How is this supposed to help a teen with attitude or substance issues? And I'm going to read to you an excerpt of the kind of stuff they would say to these 
Poor children. And also keep in mind this ritual would go from kid to kid to kid and would drag on for hours every single night. Let's just call him Jimmy. Jimmy, you suck at everything you do. You pretend you're a writer, like you're gonna write a book someday and rat everybody out. Meanwhile, you're too stupid to spell your own name, you worthless piece of shit. Why don't you end your own life and put everyone out of their misery? Oh wait, I forgot you tried and couldn't even do it, right? And then after that, they did this thing called smoosh. Weird. And after all these kids had just spent hours ripping each other to shreds, they had to basically make this puppy uh, pile kind of thing Another thing that really stuck out to me is when Paris got there, and this was like in the Midwest, somewhere in the mountains, and it was cold, Paris was not given shoes, and she had to walk outside in the snow with socks on, which I think is wild. I think after two weeks, she earned shoes, and she tried to escape, and she booked it, ran, and then she ran like two miles, and then she found a gas station, and she tried calling her aunt and explaining to her what happened, and her aunt's like, okay, okay, I'll come get you, tell me the address. She told her the address, and the cops showed up and took her back to the school, and then soon after that, she was transported to another school called called Ascent, I believe. At the first school, Sea-Doo, they would always say, oh, you don't want to get sent to Ascent or Provo. You think this is bad? Those schools are even worse. And so she got sent to a school that was allegedly worse. And the same thing happened again when she was sleeping is that two random people came and ripped out of her bed and kidnapped her and then brought her to an airport. It was a husband and a wife, bodyguard type people. And she asked the woman, I really need to go to the bathroom. And she had been handcuffed the whole time. So the woman escorted her into the bathroom, took her handcuffs off. And then she said, don't lock the stall. Just made sure it was closed. And then after Paris started taking too long, lady put her eye through the crack of the bathroom stall. And then Paris, what she did is kicked the stall door back really hard and it smashed the lady's face up and made her fall down. And then Paris ran away and hopped in a taxi and drove off to the nearest Hilton Hotel. And then Paris got out, found a payphone. She didn't have any money, but from her clubbing days, she knew how to like rig a payphone so she didn't have to pay. And so she called her mom up and her mom was like, okay, Paris, just stay with me, stay calm. Everything's gonna be okay. But little did she know that Paris's mom's phone was tapped. Since her phone was tapped, they were able to get the exact location of Paris. And then the cops came and got her. And then she got sent to the new school. And she would try to tell her parents that she was being abused at the school and that it, they were doing a a lot of horrible things to her. The counselors would beat the kids and they'd make really disgusting comments to the kids while they were showering. But the school had brainwashed the parents into thinking, if your kids are telling you they're being abused or saying all these horrible things, they're just trying to manipulate you to take them out of the school. Just complete brainwash the parents. Then she gets to this new school and it's more like a wilderness camp. And so they have to carry 80 pound backpacks through the mountain. And there's the one group leader that tells Paris, if you try to run away, I'm gonna bury you here. I will beat the shit out of you. Really spooked Paris. Paris, and so she listened to everything that lady had to say. They were starting to break away at her. And time goes by at that school. It's very similar to the previous school. And they had that like rap program. They were all basically the same, but they called different like therapies, different things. And one day Paris and this girl named Tess decide to run away from the wilderness camp and they book it into the woods and they're running and running and running. And then they come upon this trailer, ask this lady for help. They made up a lie and said, we were camping and we needed to run away from our boyfriends. And so the lady took her in and gave her a hot showers and food. And they were so grateful for it. And then the lady dropped them off. Paris called somebody and her family about it and saying, I escaped again. I need your help. I'm gonna hop on this train to escape. And so her and Tess tried to hop on this train, but the police were right on the train platform. And so they got taken back to the school again. And then she's getting taken to a new school. It's called Cascade. And her parents are bringing her there. And she hadn't seen her parents in a long time. And Paris said, well, I feel like I'm so raggedy. Can I just get like my hair done before I go to the new school? And her parents agreed. And so she steals some cash out of her mom's bag. And and goes to the bathroom and sneaks out the bathroom window and then long story short she runs away and then she gets caught again and then when she's brought into the back of the school and it's doing her intake they do like a whole full body cavity search that's very invasive. And what she did, she wrapped her hair up in a bun and then wrapped the money in her bun to hide it. And I wanna read this passage to you that just really describes how disgusting these schools were. I had learned that these strip searches were about invasion, not investigation. It was a demonstration of their power over every part of your body. So they focused on the private parts, the parts you instinctively try to protect. Some of them obviously enjoyed it. They were not even bothering to pretend. The cavity searches like any SA. Once I understood that, it was easy to fool them. And so she's at this school for a little while it's like the same deal as the previous schools and then she meets this little girl and she calls her mouse and they decide to escape together and they find a 7-eleven and Paris uses that little bit of cash she had to buy them disguises so she gets some cheap mascara and paints mustache and goatee on them and darkens their eyebrows with it and then also buys hats and sweatshirts and so they disguise themselves looking like guys and then they hop on a gray pound bus to LA that was also something that had blown Paris's cover in the past when she escaped was that cops would recognize 
recognize her or they had like a wanted picture of her, you know? So she had a disguise and they made it out in LA and crashed with them for a while, but Paris's money didn't last long and she, she talked to her family friend who lived in New York named Biff and Biff offered to fly her to New York where he was living and stay with his family. But Biff said, you can only come. You can't bring that random girl, especially since she's a minor. I could get in huge trouble for that. So you're gonna have to leave her behind. And so Paris felt horrible about this. She brought Mouse and her to a Denny's and gave Mouse the rest of her money to pay for the bill. And she said to Mouse, I'm just gonna go to the bathroom quick. I'll be right back. And then ran out of Denny's and never came back. She has no idea what happened to that Mouse girl. And honestly, I am dying to know. So then Paris hops on a plane to New York and is camping out with Biff's family for a while. And then one day Biff took Paris out to a diner and then all of a sudden Paris's family shows up. It was a setup. They let her have a few days of freedom and then they caught her and they brought her back to a new school. And I'm gonna read you this description about the school. Most people who work there seem to get off on degrading children and seeing them naked. They seem to get a creepy pleasure from hitting, shoving, terrifying, and humiliating us. The few staff members who tried to be decent didn't last or their decency didn't last. I suppose they had to convince themselves they had no choice. And a couple times Paris had been sent to OBS, OBS, and that was solid solitary confinement. As you may know in prison, it was pretty much the same thing. And in order for her to get herself through it, she started to envision her future world, her future life, pretty much started manifesting the woman she wanted to be once she got out of school. She said that once she got out of solitary confinement, she had to go and have a late night gynecology exam, which I just think is so sickening. And it fast forwards to her getting let out. They brought her home early, a few weeks before her 18th birthday, because the parents had been starting hearing rumors about how how all the ABUSE was actually true and that how Paris wasn't lying to them and about how those schools had been brainwashing them. Moving into school after reform, she tried to go back to private schools in New York City and she just was not about it. And she was cutting classes and failing tests, so she got kicked out. And she was also really behind on her schooling because the troubled teen schools said, oh yeah, we have great academics. We're gonna do the most for your child. Meanwhile, they were just doing manual labor all the time and none of the credits that Paris had gotten from the reform schools transferred to the New York City schools. So she was 18 and had enough credits as a 10th grader and she was just so unmotivated. Well, I think she did briefly mention she get her, got her GED years down the road. Moving into her young adulthood, Paris started living out the dream she envisioned from the solitary confinement and she started modeling and was partying. She would network a lot at these events. And then moving on to the simple life, well, they had a tight production schedule in 2003 and originally Paris wanted Nikki, her sister, to do it with her, but her parents were like, no, 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 too close to home. Paris, you are not dragging our other daughter into it. And so then Paris asked Nicole Richie, her childhood best friend, to be in the show with her, and the show was a giant success. And she also said that the Midwestern community and the family that she lived with, they welcomed us with open arms and went along with all our shenanigans. The mischief was never mean-spirited. We loved the Letting family. They were the kind of family Conrad Hilton aspired to be and never had. During the Simple Life era, Paris realized she was pregnant and she had to A-B-O-R-T the baby. And she she said, it's an intensely private agony that's impossible to explain. The only reason I'm talking about it now is that so many women are facing it and they feel so alone and judged and abandoned. I want them to know they're not alone and that they don't owe anyone an explanation. And I have so much respect for her, including this in her book, with her being such like a big influence. And I know she wanted young women to look at this and listen to this story. And I'm just really proud of her for opening up about that. Fast forward to the SEX tape. Paris doesn't remember much about that night. She said that her her boyfriend at the time was pressuring her a lot to do it and he was a couple years older than her and he was saying come on be an adult this is what like adults do it's not that big of a deal I'm only gonna be the one who sees it yada 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 and she didn't want to do it she was being peer pressured into it and so she got really really drunk and took quaaludes and ended up doing the video and then some time passes and she's in Australia and a 37 second clip of it gets leaked at that time she felt like her life was over in so many ways she had already started filming the first season of the simple life and was mending her relationship with her parents and gaining their trust back and then this happened and brought her back to square one and she emphasized that she did not have anything to do with the release of the tape and what's crazy looking back on made me think while reading this is I know Kim Kardashian did the same thing Kim released it with her consent she made a deal I wonder how Paris felt about that like taking her trauma as inspiration for Kim to boost her own career and here's a crazy story time from her 21st birthday the morning of her 21st birthday she was wicked hungover and she forgot that her drunk ass said the night before that she wanted to go sky 
skydiving. And so she had made a reservation and everything and she wakes up the morning wicked hungover and she was like, well, I can't back out now. And she had like a whole entourage of people with her. This shook me. She's like, yeah, I have like all my friends with me, but you know, I'm just afraid that if I back out, somebody's gonna tell the press, like I really can't trust anybody. I'm gonna have to pull through with this. And so she did. She got sky dove, skydived, wicked hungover on an empty stomach, wanting to constantly throw up. Another interesting thing she brought up was that iconic photo we know of the Holy Trinity, Britney Spears, Lindsay Lohan, and Paris Hilton in that car. And apparently the whole feud between Paris and Lindsay was just created by the media to sell papers, just like get their name out there and cause drama, kind of like how, you know, YouTubers do that nowadays. It was like the same kind of thing. That feud was fake. Her and Lindsay are not close, but she respects her. And another crazy story of hers from her young 20s, this reminds me of Marilyn Monroe. So Paris was on the cover of Playboy. She had been asked so many times by Hugh to be on the cover. She had partied in the mansion before. Some of her friends were bunnies, but she had never been in the magazine because she knew it would break her family's heart more than she already had. In the same year, her SEX tape came out. Playboy gave her like an award. And so they put her on the cover of the magazine for that year, like sexy icon of the year without her permission. She was so upset by that. Her family was so upset by it. And that just really reminds me of Marilyn Monroe because Marilyn, I believe on the first cover of Playboy without her permission, Hugh had gotten a hold of um, some old photos from Marilyn's early career and gotten a hold of the rights and used it without her permission. She had sold the rights of the images away and the same thing happened with Paris crazy. Next, okay, Paris got a DUI. She was filming a music video and then they had like a little celebration afterwards and she said she had one margarita and then she was driving home and was wicked tired and exhausted. They did like an 18 hour day of filming for it and an empty stomach. She was right on the line for it being a, an illegal limit of alcohol in her system and so she went to court and got three years of probation and a four month suspension of her license and she was treated just like any other civilian would be. She got no special treatment and then there was like a mix up between her license being suspended and her probation and pretty much there was a miscommunication there and she was driving illegally and this got her in more trouble and she ended up having to have 45 days of jail time and so she went to jail. She was put in solitary confinement and it brought back a lot of memories from her troubled school time. Um, it was very traumatic for her. Oh and then this is wild is that she was sleeping one night in jail and then all of a sudden she woke up in the middle of the night and one of the guards had a camera over her face. He was trying to take a picture of her and sell it to the media because so many reporters, paparazzi, everything were trying to to get photos of her in her orange jumpsuit and then she gets out and when she comes home she was stunned to find out that the bling ring which is a group of high school students at that time who were robbing celebrities houses had robbed her house and stolen at least a million dollars worth of stuff from her house and she just felt so violated and unsafe she had just gotten out of jail and now is coming home to her house being ransacked basically and she continued on with her career she had real estate holdings spas nightclubs opening hotels she was writing and recording music she had product lines perfumes all that jazz. Really tried to build up her career after all of that mess. Okay, now I'm going to move into some of like the general themes that were present throughout the book. PTSD, and it is clear that the school she went to and a lot of the stories that I had mentioned earlier traumatized her. She said for most of her adult life, she has a love-hate relationship with sleep because she has night terrors of being kidnapped again. And it was hard for her to drain out the scream therapy she had at those schools. And so she would drink away the pain at some points in her early 20s. And she said years later, she started Googling some of the schools and she found out that children had passed away at the schools that she lived from either self-harm or from starvation or hypothermia or just being um, ABUSED and staff members had been arrested and convicted. It wasn't as mainstream as it is now. People were starting to be held accountable moving on to activism. Um, in the time that Reddit came out, a lot of survivors from the troubled teen schools started speaking out about their experiences that were all very similar to Paris's. I forgot to bring it up earlier in the round part. What breaks my heart is a lot of wealthy children were sent to these schools, but also a lot of foster children were sent to these schools because either the system didn't know what to do with them or they were problematic and had behavioral issues. My heart breaks for children um, that were fostered being at those schools and being yelled at like, you don't matter, nobody wants you and all that stuff. Being in those rap programs when you have literally no one by your side, no family. Paris was on Reddit. She learned a lot about like her classmates that had been there and like a lot of people had fallen into addiction and um, ended their own lives because of the trauma 
trauma they experienced at these schools and families were ruined because of these schools. And so then she decided to come out with the This Is Paris documentary and really expose these schools for what they were, what they are. She said, "In since the release of This Is Paris, I've made multiple trips to Washington, D.C. to meet with legislators and the White House staff about the desperately needed changes in laws pertaining to regulation and oversight in the troubled teen industry. My goal is to shut down every facility with a track record of ABUSE and make sure that every child has access to proper care. The bills we've helped pass and the laws we've helped codify are the greatest achievement of her career and what she is most proud of. Another theme was love for her and she opened up about how with all the trauma she went through that she had a very strange relationship with love and relationships for a very long time and at times she did feel asexual because of all the ABUSE. She said it feels wild that this world has like paints me as an SEX symbol when that's the farthest thing from the truth and she felt like she would never looked at love as a forever thing until she met her now husband named Carter. Moving on to marriage, so she never thought she would be one that's like wifey material, but she feels like she has such a strong connection with Carter and has never met someone like him. And they're both very entrepreneurial and workhorses and she feels like she really found her other half. What's interesting about their relationship is he had met her multiple times, but she didn't remember him. She said she saw right through him. She was too busy being queen of the night and they had mutual friends, but they had never really crossed paths. They ended up meeting each other at Thanksgiving one year at her family's house and Paris was just blown away by his intelligence. And she said she didn't even know a relationship could make you feel protected and empowered at the same time until she met Carter. And I'm really happy for her um, about this. I had no idea that they were so in love genuinely because I was under the impression that it was kind of an arranged marriage because my friend told me who had watched the Paris and Love series, it just seemed like their parents had been trying to get them together for a long time. And I was just afraid that it was more like an arranged marriage vibe. So I'm glad that's not the case. And next, I want to read off some quotes from this book that I feel like are interesting and good advice and some lessons to take away from this book. Here's the first one. If you follow the crowd, you're too late. Whoever blazed that trail has moved on, so you might as well blaze a trail that suits you, even if other people don't understand it. Here's another one. If you know that in your heart that you are hot, you are hot, according to the laws of hotness physics. I got a kick out of that one. Different scares people who love you. Purely on instinct, driven by fear, they try to protect you. Like my parents tried so hard to protect me. I promise it's coming from a place of love. Try not to be mad. If you need to hear someone say it and, and the people in your life just can't, I've got you. Go. Do your thing, I trust you. I really like that quote. Know your worth, girls. You're not lucky to be at the party. The party is lucky to have you. Apply as needed to relationships, jobs, and family. Follow your curiosity. It's calling you towards your true purpose. Don't waste energy living a life someone else designed for you. Life is one per customer. Let them do theirs and you do yours. Accept the necessity of endless reinvention. Staying the same is A, boring, and B, impossible. There's no substitute for hard work. Keep killing it and something will happen. Probably not what you expected, but something. Know the star you are and see yourself as part of a galaxy. Thank you guys so much for hearing me out on this video and watching till the end. I really, really appreciate it and I hope you enjoyed this video. Comment your thoughts down below. Um, I usually report on corruption in the fashion and entertainment industries along with books from time to time and a little bit of whatever else I'm interested in. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff too, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out my other social media videos. I have it up here and link below. And thank you guys again so much for watching. I really appreciate it and have a good one. Bye.